Because a lot of people don't know that they've been traumatized by stuff because they don't know how to recognize it. That's one thing I want I want to kind of define. What is trauma? Because, you know, that seems to be like a hot topic. Like everybody's like, oh, I'm traumatized from this or this is trauma and that's trauma. No, it's not. <laughs> like some situations are not really traumatic. Like I think I guess it's just me looking at it. I can be like, oh, I think it's you being dramatic versus, you know, actually being a traumatic response. But like what would you define as trauma? Yeah. So what I did, I went to an official website to get the clinical definition and then I'll break it down and explain what it means. Okay. Which I'm covering everything. So mm-hmm. um SAMHSA, which is the substance abuse and mental health mm-hmm. um association. Mm-hmm. Is trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So that's a really lengthy way of saying that basically trauma is a response to either an intentional or um, whether it's, it actually happened or it was interpreted as a threat. Mm. Um, so that's your response Either it was a threat physically Or emotionally And it's the way that we respond to it And it's usually trauma when it begins to impact domains of your life mm-hmm. Like it, it um, impacts how you're able to go throughout your life Whether it's a physical response How you interact in relationships How you process fear How you process situations moving forward um, And then the spiritual well-being Will pretty much be like You know uh, Fear. Sometimes people lose their faith, mm-hmm. you know, as a result of traumatic experiences. So basically, trauma is a response to an, an experience or a circumstance that was either harmful or interpreted as being harmful. Mm-hmm. So how does you hit on something? Um, how does both trauma? I would say how does mental health and spirituality do they kind of mix, coexist, or do they are they kind of like separate? I believe they mix. Uh-huh. I would either say mix or coexist because, you know, um, you know, the word not to get like preacher or anything, but the word says he wished that above all things that we prosper, being good right. even as our soul prospers. Mm-hmm. So I believe that that God looks at us as tripart beings. Mm. So I don't think he wants us to be whole physically mm-hmm. and spiritually, but not emotionally, mm. because the kicker is if you're not well emotionally, yeah. it can show up physically. Right. So I believe it's. Either coexistence or mixed. So, me and not well emotionally, what does that look like? Not well emotionally? Yeah. What does it look like physically or in life? In life. <clears throat> it could be isolation. Mm. Where you don't really want to be around people. Um, sometimes it could be a, a tip in the balance where you present like you're always happy because sometimes people like to cover or mask. Um, your appetite will be changed. So, mm-hmm. either you'll eat a lot. Or you won't really have an appetite, fatigue, difficulty sleeping, or what we call hypersomnia, which means that you sleep a lot, mm-hmm. concentration, not able to make decisions, no motivation or interest, um, or no pleasure in doing things that you usually would. Those are some of the primary indicators. And mm. you have some that may be where there it impacts your domains, your life, where you're not able to really perform as well as a family member, as a friend, as a coworker, colleague employee yeah um so it begins to impact how you interact with yourself and other people yeah so and psychosis that's another indicator that you're not well so psychosis so you kind of hit on something i was about to go to so what is psychosis psychosis is basically a term whenever a person um begins to experience things are not that are not real so Mm -hmm. that could be Audio or visual hallucinations, audio being hearing things that no one else can hear, visual seeing things that no one else can see, paranoia, feeling like someone is watching you, following you, or out to get you. Sometimes you may feel or sense things that are not actually um, accurate. And then coupled with the hallucinations, sometimes it could be like commands. Mm -hmm. So you may hear people say, um, oh, I did it because they made me do it, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. So is that demonic? (laughs) <laughs> I think that's loaded. <laughs> I think I do. I think that's loaded. What yeah. I say that is demonic, mm-hmm. possibly. Mm-hmm. Um, but because I believe in mental health, I don't want to always be the person to say that everything is demonic. That's yeah. why I'm speaking so slowly on yeah. it. Um, 
I would say, poss- yeah, I would lean more towards yes than not. Yeah. And the reason why I ask is because, you know, you we grew up in church, mm-hmm. like, especially black church. Mm-hmm. Everything's, Everything's a demonic. demonic. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's about it. You so, go to hell, all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like, it's a fine line between like mental health and the demonic because of the fact that people are really responding to situations and to trauma that may have been triggered by something that was said in a sermon Mm -hmm. or something that is being done in the atmosphere of church. And that could be like what you're saying, psychosis, or it could be a demonic expression as well too. So let me ask you this. If a person is being tormented in their mind, is that demonic? To me, I think yes. So then that's part of what people sometimes experience with psychosis. Hmm. So if you're you're constantly hearing like you're not good enough, you're not this, you're not that, nobody else can hear it, people are perceiving you as being a particular way, you're being outcast, is that not torment? Mm. Yeah. So that's why I would say I would lean more towards yes than not. Yeah. Um But like we we hear we hear that ourselves though, like whenever we're, you know, trying to do stuff, like we'll hear like, Oh, you're not good enough for that, you know. Oh no, psychosis is another level. It's another level of that. So it's beyond that. Yeah. So if you're hearing those voices now, you're not experiencing psychosis, then you just that's like a demonic attack. It could be. So I mean, like we come under attack where it's like, Oh, you're never gonna be anything. That's never gonna work. Mm -hmm. You you hear those things, but then imagine you being in a like pictures are talking to you. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that's a completely different experience. Yeah. So that's why I say I would lean more towards yes, but I will not say that everyone that experiences psychosis is demon possessed mm. because sometimes it could be a matter of um, you could be delusional because you're in so much physical pain, mm-hmm. or sometimes it could be medication induced mm-hmm. or um, drug induced. Mm-hmm. So like if a person is using different drugs and they have a, a psychotic response to it, or if you take painkillers. Yeah. You know, it has side effects. So I can't always say that it's yeah. on it. So, and this is another thing. I'm, I'm just coming up with all the questions now because now that you got my wheels turning. <laughs> <laughs> so, because I've heard this term before. A friend of mine has said this. Um, and I, and I kind of agree with this. Do you think that we have medicated our demons? In some ways. In some ways. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I ask that is because just like how you explain the difference between psychosis and like a, a, a psychosis and a demonic attack, um, they are very much like similar. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I think that there is that fine line of this is this could be more, you know, leaning towards the mental health space. Mm-hmm. Because of the fact that, you know, you can't just pray it away and it's not just going away they, because they're constantly being tormented with it. And it's not saying that prayer can't can't help. Of course. Because prayer does work. Mm-hmm. But there's, to me, I don't, I don't want to say this and, and sound like a false preacher. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's a certain, it's a certain level where you can tell it's like, okay, there's more to this mm-hmm. than an actual thing. You get what I'm saying? I do. I, I will leave with God can do anything. Mm. And you have to remember when we read the Gospels, there were people who were tormented by demons. They didn't go to therapy. Right. They brought them to Jesus, and Jesus healed them. Right. That was that. But then there are sometimes whenever people have hurt that's so severe mm-hmm. that they may need to talk about it. Yeah. They may need to talk it out. And then being able to do that, then that can you know kind of help process feelings and maybe bring things to the surface. Mm-hmm. Because let's say you're opening the door for the torment. Yeah. Or the demonic um, activity, but you don't know how you're doing it. Mm-hmm. If you're talking it out, then it's kind of like they're walk, they're uh, they're working hand in hand. So you talk it out, you understand. Oh, well, this is where this came from. Now you get your healing, and now that door, mm-hmm. that portal that's been open, you understand this can't happen. Anymore. Right. I can't entertain this anymore. Yeah. So I said to go hand in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's like because I I agree wholeheartedly with that. I believe that. It goes hand in hand in that way because of the fact that, you know, we see things on the spiritual side and we also see things in the natural. Um, and I believe definitely that Jesus can heal anything because just like you said, when any, whenever, whenever anyone had an issue, they went to Jesus and he healed them. Mm-hmm. His presence alone, whether they was, he, whether he physically touched them or just his being there, they were, they stopped being tormented. Um, and I think too, it's like, it kind of leads into like what we're actually talking about, uh, which is trauma and healing. Which is like, you know, 
a lot of these things can be brought on to certain events that has taken place in people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, things that has been done to them by someone else. Um, and honestly, you, I mean, I mean, well, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I would say like 99.9% or a hundred percent of trauma are basically induced by a, a, a action that has been, been taking place by two human beings. Like somebody that's like physically hurt somebody, not physically, but has hurt somebody in some way. Yeah. But you um, know, sometimes trauma can be, I'm um, hearing it from that happened to someone else. Yeah. So like George Floyd, mm. Whenever George Floyd, it was like a month and a half. Every time I thought about him, I would tear up. Mm. Like that just, and I don't know, maybe it was the time that was going on or what. But thinking about that made me like, if my dad was like, oh, I'm about to run to the store. It's like, like Lord, protect my daddy while he going to the store. Yeah. Why? Because of. Because of that. Yeah. yeah. So it may not be necessarily as severe, but trauma can also come from hearing things. Mm. That have happened to other people Or witnessing things that have happened to other people Yeah I think Gosh I don't even know we're going to hit on topic <laughs> Because you said something I, and, I, and I'm not trying to be racist But it's like I think that's like the difference Between black people and white people Because I remember I, I went to this forum um, That one of my friends had um, put on at his church um, And it was right after the I want to say it was right after No it wasn't the George Floyd Because it was here It was 2016 uh, it was after the um, Trayvon Martin shooting. Um, and he was explaining how he pretty much had a panel of people, um, black and white. White guy got up and said, you know, I've never realized, you know, just how black people feel traumatized and things like in that way whenever they're pulled over by a cop. And talking about how, you know, I say whatever I want to a cop. And <laughs> he was like, and I know he's not going to do anything to me. Mm-hmm. It was like, but it was like whenever I, because he was like, he he equated it to a, a story with him actually being in the car with a black woman with his black friends and they got pulled over. Mm-hmm. Seeing how things kind of unfolded, not just with, you know, the Trayvon Martin shootings, but now you got a series of events that's taking place. And it's almost like, you know, black folk can go nowhere <laughs> without something happening to them. And a lot of that, in my in my in my, in my um, opinion, um, is fear mongering because you know a lot of a lot of it is kind of fear based, but a lot of it is um, it's really it's something that really happens to a lot of people. Because I know for me, the one case that really struck me the most was um, Philando Castile mm-hmm. when he was shot because it was like here is a guy who is doing everything right. He announced, "Hey, like, hey, I have a gun. I'm willing to give you the gun, and de-escalate the situation because this is what it is." And he still got shot and killed in front of his wife or his girlfriend and his kids. And I think that one lines up with what you're saying, like how that could be a trauma induced by watching someone else. Mm-hmm. Because for me, I resonated a lot with that because I was like, "Man, I'm that could have been me. Like, <laughs> I'm doing everything right. I'm mm-hmm. trying to do everything right, and." This person only sees the color of their skin, and and that's it. And I know that's like to all my my um, my Caucasian brothers and sisters. <laughs> it might be hard to hear that, but <laughs> but it's truth. I believe there are some white brothers and sisters that can, at best, sympathize with us, right? Mm-hmm. Um. So I can't say that they don't get it, mm-hmm. but I believe that you have to be willing to get it. Yeah. To get it, yeah. That makes yeah. So I believe that you know, they they may have a like him being in the car and seeing it for himself that he may he may understand it, but it's kind of like you don't really know what it's like to walk in the store and be followed. Yeah. Until you're being followed, exactly. not just one time, but it's a a, a pattern. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because so trauma and healing. Because I know a lot of people are still even to this day still trying to heal from all that took place with that. But let's talk about like our own personal battles. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people they avoid, and you can agree to this because you're you're a therapist. But a lot of people they may try to avoid finding healing in a in a certain I don't even say certain, but in specific traumatic situations um, because of how deep the hurt is. Um, and I think too is like. The wrong advice would be to tell them, hey, just get over it. (laughs) Always the wrong advice. Yeah. But at what point do you get over it or move past it to start the process of healing? Is 
three years long enough? Is five years long enough? Is a month long enough? Because, you know, the Bible says, you know, you got to forgive quickly and, do, and these things like that. But for a lot of people, forgiveness is hard. Like, it's tough. Yeah. So I believe we forgive by faith. Mm. And so sometimes it may not, the, the forgiveness may not hit right then. Mm-hmm. But it's the will to forgive. Yeah. We're in the in the in the vein of being willing to forgive. We're on the right track. Yeah. Um, I believe as it relates to trauma, you can't really put a time frame on it. Mm. So if something happened to you, it would be insensitive for me to say, TJ, that was like 10 years ago. Mm. Because for you, it may still hurt. The pain may still be real. The flashbacks, if you're having flashbacks, the nightmares or whatever, it may still be real to you. So I don't know that it's necessarily a time frame. But I will say that... Um, <clears throat> Therapy is work. Yeah. So you think about, you know, one of your kids, or even when we were kids, Mm -hmm. if you fell and you got hurt, even though your mom was coming with bandages, you're like, no, don't touch it. Right. Or because (laughs) you you don't want it to hurt. that pain. Yeah. And so sometimes we can respond the same way emotionally where it's like, yeah, I'd rather not talk about that. Let's not bring that up. Yeah. Because it hurts. Yeah. And so once you're willing, I would say once you're willing to go to therapy and follow through. Yeah. That's when you're. Yeah, because you don't want to go in and then you get to a point where you stop and now you've opened up all these memories and everything feels raw all over again and you don't finish and, and push through. Mm. But it's definitely work. So once you're willing to do the work, whatever that starting point looks like for you, that's when I would say it's a good time. Yeah. So what and this is me. So what what situations do you think would require a person to go to therapy? I believe people should be in therapy whether they have trauma or not. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm pro therapy. Um, you need to be talking to somebody. <laughs> yeah, seriously, because it's like it's so much stuff that goes on in our lives in the course of a day, a month, and a week, and just yeah. being able to have the safe space to be able to share what's going on with you or to be able to process your feelings and your thoughts. Yeah, everyone should. I believe everyone should should have therapy at least once in their life. So you can't ask me that question because I'm gonna say everybody needs it. Uh-huh. I will say if you find that it's causing, if it's specifically related to trauma, if it's causing an impairment, mm-hmm. like you notice that you are avoidant mm-hmm. or isolating, if it has impacted you, then you may want to consider yeah getting some treatment. Good. Good. Okay. So what does the process of healing look like for someone that is dealing with? Um, I would say with unforgiveness. Um, because I've talked about this on my um, on my podcast, um, or I made like a, a personal video, just listing out the steps to forgiveness as it pertains to like what helped me to get you know get to forgiveness. But you know my steps, they're great, but you know they may not be <laughs> great for everybody. <laughs> so what's like what's a proper process from like to healing? If I was to say if I was somebody that was like harboring unforgiveness in their heart. Start with acknowledging. Mm-hmm. Acknowledging it. If you're not willing to acknowledge that you're harboring unforgiveness, at least acknowledge the emotions that's associated with what happened. Mm. If you start with acknowledging it, you're you're more likely to move towards forgiving. So, but if you act like, oh, that wasn't even that serious, so I don't even care about that. But you think about it every single day. Yeah, you're not gonna make much progress. Yeah. So I would say starting with um, acknowledging the emotion. Being willing to process it, if you're able to discuss it with someone or that person, definitely want to move towards that. Honestly, sometimes when people do things um, to you or cause you pain, you can't always have those conversations for for one reason or the other. So being willing to process and being willing to forgive. Mm. Those are probably the first few steps that I think about towards healing. Yeah. So we say, give me yourself grace. Yeah. So you say, acknowledge it. Acknowledge what they did, or acknowledge like what you did, or what. Acknowledge first. I would acknowledge the fact that it bothered me. Mm. Whether it it angered me, it hurt me, whatever. Start with acknowledging that. Acknowledge the emotions that come along with it, and then acknowledging you can acknowledge what the person did and what you did Mm -hmm. because that's a part of the, the the process. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because that's 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 something that I listed out was acknowledging it and then owning what happened, um, because all of that goes into the acknowledging phase, because if you just like brush it on the road, like you said, then you're not acknowledging you just trying to move forward, move past it. So if you're not acknowledging that it bothered you, then why do you need to forgive them? Obviously, something transpired between yeah. from from where you are now to when the event happened. 
Yeah. So that's why I say starting with acknowledging. Yeah. Because sometimes it's not easy to admit that something that happened hurt you. Mm. Like sometimes it's easier to be mad about something than to, than to be vulnerable to be sad. Mm. So being able to say this hurt me, they caught me by surprise. I never saw this coming. But whatever is associated with it, just being willing to acknowledge that and put that out there first. Yeah. So if someone, what 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 does it look like if someone isn't acknowledging that it, that this has happened? Denial. Denial. Mm-hmm. It could be denial, or sometimes it can manifest as like triggers, mm-hmm. anger, mm-hmm. irritation. Um, avoidance. Mm. You know you're upset with somebody, so you're not going to go to the same dinner as them because mm. you don't want to see them. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> or that you know that they've hurt your feelings, so every time you you talk to them, the vibes are a little off. You're a little irritable. Yeah. You like to throw shade and and you know undercuts and things like that. Um. So we can't throw shade. No, don't. Yeah. <laughs> pettiness. Pettiness is is. It's not a god. <laughs> Pettiness is not a god. That's I myself included. Pettiness I can't be a petty a preacher. Mm-hmm. Like, come on. Listen, we're like, supposed to be showing love. I like showing. I like showing love and, and shade. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, is it really love though? <laughs> it's really love, but yeah. I, yeah um, those are a couple of ways I would say. Yeah, that's how you're you're able. Yeah, or like. Whenever you are avoiding a conversation surrounding it, mm. that's one of the ways. That's one of the ways. Mm. So, so these are like symptoms: throwing shade, avoidance. You're not going to find this in DSM. It's not. Good <laughs> <enough. It's> not <laughs> but you have, and part of it is you have to know yourself. Yeah, like there, I can literally think of a situation right now that it's like when I talk to them, why do I keep them mm. arms limp? Yeah. Why don't I allow them in my space anymore? Mm. It's because I was hurt by them. Yeah. Um. So instead of being nasty when I see them or nice nasty. Yeah. And I just had to say, okay, this was hurtful, and I forgive them, but they don't get that type of access to me anymore. Yeah. So, all right, let's let's go. Let's jump off the cliff a little bit. Okay. <laughs> let's talk about church hurt. Okay. Does church hurt exist? I believe so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I, I definitely believe church hurt exists. Why do you think, and this is coming from your professional okay. opinion, why do you think that most pastors and preachers um, shade or put down church hurt and act like it don't exist? I would challenge the word most mm-hmm. and replace it with some. But I think it could be a matter of emotional intelligence. Because mm. we talked about earlier, all believers don't see ourselves as tripart beings. Mm. So break that down, the tripart being part. Body, soul, and spirit. Yeah, Your, your soul is comprised of your, your, um, your mind, your will, and your emotion. Mm-hmm. But whenever a lot of people consider us as believers, they just look at the physical and the spiritual. They don't consider the emotional. Yeah. So if you're dealing with someone who doesn't consider the emotions and don't does not acknowledge the emotional parts of us, how that impacts the other two dimensions of us, then mm. they're going to be less likely to acknowledge church hurt. Mm. Which I mean, you could be. I mean, you can have work hurt. Yeah, working in toxic environments, you can yeah. have family hurt. But for whatever reason, people tend to hone in on church hurt. Maybe yeah. because they 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 would imagine that it would be a safer, a safer place. place sometimes yeah, sometimes it is. But um, yeah. So that's like if I see you physically and spiritually, but you're coming to me and telling me you're hurt, and it's like pray about it mm. <laughs> because the only guy, the only that's thing a- I can work with is your body and your spirit. I'm wow. not considering the emotion. Yeah. So I think sometimes that's how um, church hurt is addressed mm. by, like we said, everything is a demon. Yeah. The spirit of offense. Yeah. Right? <laughs> or just not considering that there could have been more grace here. Yeah. Or there this this could have been taken in a completely different direction. Yeah. 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 I know I've heard a lot of people because I usually when people pray this stuff, just pray about it. <laughs> Get out of my face, just pray about it. Yeah, but it's like <laughs> and and we and you know, we already covered it where prayer does yeah. work, yeah. right? Jesus does, he can heal anything, but sometimes it's just a matter it of takes like, more. Like if you did something to me, we have the type of relationship where I should be able to be like Hey, TJ, when you said that, you know, that was hurtful. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I'm expecting us to, like, sit down and cry about it yeah. together, but at least to be able to say this was hurtful to me. 
Mm-hmm. And if I said that to you, or flip it, if you were like, Marisha, what you did really hurt me, and I'm like, go oh, pray about it. <laughs> I mean, how would you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I'd be tight. I'd be like, what? Yeah, or like, well, that's um, that, that's a spirit of offense. Yeah. That's a spirit of pride. Yeah. But that's but that's what a lot of people do in the church. They'll brush it off like that. They'll say, oh, that's this, that's that. And like, oh, you got all this, you got all that. And like, just get over it. But I think, like, there's more to it. There's more to it. Like, we, conversations should be had between people that are offended and the offense. Um, and that's because of the fact that, you know, in order to really find true healing, you have to have those conversations, those tough conversations. I think a lot of people just want to avoid having those tough conversations because of which, which in my opinion is there's an intimidation factor mm-hmm. that comes in that. So like, cause me, I'm, I'm vulnerable. I'll talk about my church hurt experience like a lot. And mm-hmm. I talk about, you know, how it, how it led me through, a cycle of just, you know, experiencing rejection, experiencing all these different things, but actually coming on the other side of it. And it's like, oh, well, I recognize that, you know, I had a lot of part, a lot of fault in this. You know, I idolized my pastor. I did all these different things. I tried to make sure that I was, you know, rising the ranks and doing this stuff. But at the same time, I was neglecting my own spiritual health and my own physical health, chasing after these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when the hurt or the offense came, it came in it came in waves. But but when it came, you know, it made me get to a place where I was like, man, I like what you just saying, I can't watch I can't watch a sermon mm-hmm. without feeling triggered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't go to the church without feeling triggered. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a lot of people in a sense because, you know, they'll try to hide and go to other churches and stuff instead of just trying to talk mm-hmm. and having those conversations. And really talking it out and just going to the person that defended like, hey, look, this happened. It's like, you hurt me. But I think there's fear in that because a lot of people don't, they know what the retaliation is going to be. Well, also, you don't, nobody wants to hear about themselves. Mm. So if someone came to you and ran down all these, I don't know, specifics or details about how you hurt them, would you be able to sit with a straight face and be like, Without thinking to yourself like, dang, that was messed up. Yeah. Or I hate that I did that. Yeah. You, you don't necessarily want to feel whatever feelings are associated with, with having to hear about yourself. Yeah. I I know for me, and my wife can attest to this, and she's in the room, y'all, so. <laughs> <laughs> but whenever she comes to me with stuff, I'm quick to jump on offense. Because mm-hmm. you like when we defend ourselves, we quick to go on the offense. Well, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, mm-hmm. and I'm doing all X, Y, and Z instead of just sitting back processing and like, oh, okay, I didn't do this, mm-hmm. I didn't do that, because we don't like to hear that. Men really don't like to hear that, <laughs> and women don't either. That's right. what I'm saying. It's, right. it's, it's, nobody really wants to sit back and hear um, about themselves. Yeah, but it was like I was talking to someone recently. Um, they were mentioning the actions. Of a leader, and I'm like, one thing I learned is leaders need grace too. Yeah, it's everybody first time here, whether you one or a hundred. It's all our first times here, so leaders need grace too. It doesn't mean that they should be hurtful, mm. and you can't necessarily hold them accountable. But yeah. you also have to remember the same way that you don't always handle situations the best way. Leaders don't always handle situations the best way. Yeah, and that's the thing I learned because one thing I realized was our generation is very different. From prior generations, mm-hmm. how we process things, how they process things, mm-hmm. how they deal with things, how we deal with things. Mm-hmm. They reject therapy. We are, our generation is coming around to embracing and we want to talk to somebody. Mm-hmm. But the older generation, they necessarily don't want to talk, don't want to talk it out. They just talk to God and leave it there. <laughs> and honestly, I'd be wondering, like, the guy, they, <laughs> the guy pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> I did that conversation actually. Right. right. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I feel you on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because I think generationally for me, I had to realize that, okay, the way I process things is different. The way this person processes things is different. Mm-hmm. They could be responding off of a prior situation that's taken place. And the way that they're responding is due to that. And I'm catching the flack because of, mm-hmm. you know, something, that's not, even something that's not even related. But this is how they responded to it the last time. And they're going to, you know, respond to it in that way. Because to me, it felt like it was egregious. It was, you know, too much. Mm-hmm. 
And it was like, I wouldn't handle it that way. But one thing I learned was, you know, well, hey, yeah, I wouldn't handle it that way. But two, it's just how different generations process things and how they're able to do things. And I'm saying that in the kind of saying, trying to say it in the most polite and professional way. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I, I hear what you're not saying, but right. I, I understand. But I, I've also come to learn that sometimes people respond to situations based on how they were taught. Yeah. And sometimes um, we don't necessarily consider if it's a matter of right or wrong. That's just how you were taught. Yeah. And so you replicate or regurgitate how you were taught to do it. Yeah. And and people can, you know, catch some wounds from that as well. Yeah. Sometimes people, not to sound condescending, but sometimes people just don't know any better. Yeah. They don't know any differently. Yeah. Um, so I would say with anyone that's experiencing church hurt, just be willing to forgive. Yeah. And don't associate that offense with Christ. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people really mess up at. Because I know from the conversations that I've had with a ton of people, um, the reason why they left the church is because they were hurt by someone X, Y, and Z. And then they end up leaving God because of that. It was like, you can't put the two together. And I think that is <laughs> tough in of itself because of the fact that, um, and you you know you're a Christian, you're a therapist as well too. You can relate. It's like a lot of people they'll leave God because of how they put uh, the person that offended them on that pedestal of God. So like say for instance, if you hurt by your pastor, you put your pastor on the pedestal as being God. The minute that that person hurts you. You thinking, oh, God hates me. I'm turning away from God because that person hurt me. So I don't think I necessarily agree with that. Mm -hmm. Even like if one of my leaders hurt me right now, it wouldn't be because I have him on the pedestal. Mm -hmm. It could just be a common exchange. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because I idolize him. It could just be um, what they said, you know, hurt a little bit. Yeah. Not even that I wasn't wrong, but, you know, I don't yeah. think it was because I was idolizing him. So I don't think it's necessarily that. I would pose the question to you during the time that you experienced church hurt. And you were idolizing your pastor. Did you really know God? Hmm. And it's no like no, I'm not no. Even, that's no a slack. really good question. No, that's a really good question because truthfully, um, I will say I knew of God. Okay. And I don't think my relationship was as deep then as I portrayed it to be. Hmm. And I think my relationship now with God is more deeper than it was then. So if your relationship. Had been your relationship with God had been back then like it is now? Mm -hmm. Do you think you still would have responded to the situation the same? Hmm. God, that's a good question. And I'm not even supposed to be asking. I'm supposed to be answering. My bad. No, I'm just no, no. But no, we having a conversation. We dialoguing. No, I love it because that's that's deep. Because I never really thought about it in that way. I don't. I mean, I don't think. No, I don't think I would respond the same way because of the fact that I know what I know now versus what I knew then. I'm, I would say I'm more mature now in my faith. And I'm not trying to open up myself, no, <laughs> open up a door for yeah. someone. <laughs> for my Come pastor, like, oh, right, try it again. <laughs> try yeah. Jesus, not me. Let me stop. <laughs> but I'm saying, like, I'm more mature now to where I can co compartmentalize and see the right things. So I'm like, okay, I see what's up. And I, I, I know from that situation, I had to learn because what I've learned was I cannot look at a pastor. In the way that we always look at pastors as they're just so esteemed and up. No, I, I honestly I see pastors as human beings, just like having like, like having a conversation with me and you. And I know God has graced me with that. Mm -hmm. And so, if something like that were to happen now, no, I wouldn't respond the same way because I see it as a human to human interaction versus how I would have saw how I saw it then was like a human to a spiritual leader that type of person interaction and like, man, it was like, it hurt. But at the same time, it was like, now I think about it. It's like, I don't think it would, I, it would hurt. Yes. But I feel like I would be more quick to go and have the conversation versus how I kind of let it linger the first time. So I'm gonna push it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Part of the thing that I have to consider when it, when it comes to God and a child of God is understanding the character of God. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, that's good. 
You understand the light. No, God is a God of love. God is not here to embarrass. God is not here to, to guilt or, you know, to like shame or condemn you. You send a son so that it would be the opposite. Yeah. So if I'm experiencing these things from a person that is a child of God, you have to recognize based on biblical scripture, that's not God. Yeah. And so if you find that that's not God, then why would you be compelled to leave God? Mm. If you know that what you saw was not his character, yeah, his character, yeah, it's like like we said before, you're giving God, God is picking up the slack for something that someone else did, yeah. It's not even a, a reflection, yeah, of him. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's why I was asking, like, if you knew God the way that you know Him now, mm-hmm. would you still have responded the same? Way? Yeah, yeah. No, that's great because I I didn't, I love the fact that you broke down the characteristic of God because that's literally how how I flow now. Because I didn't understand that then. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't know. Like, we know. Like, we say it all the time. God is love. The Holy Spirit shout and all this other stuff. And the fields and all that stuff. But it's, I think it's the actual knowing of who God is. He's 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 merciful. He's kind. He's great. Like, all, knowing all of these things about his characteristic. And then being able to separate him from an actual spiritual leader. Mm-hmm. It's like. I think that was the issue with me because, and that's why I said, like, I idolize my pastor because of the fact that I'm like, okay, well, if this guy's hearing from God, and I know a lot of church people do this, if this guy's hearing from God, I know that he's living up right. He's doing this. He's doing that. He's doing everything right to 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 match the characteristics of God. Mm-hmm. And then when that person hurts you or that person hurt me, automatically, no, I didn't think God, you know, was, you know, was was terrible. I never left God in that way. But it did make me question, well, why would God still deal with a person like that? Same, same, <laughs> same reason, reason why he deal with a person right, like me, right? right? But right. that's what a lot of people think. Because it's like, well, why would, why would God even still use a person like that? And they're nasty and they're mean and they're so disgusting. And, and you talk about you, they're a spiritual leader and they just that and the other. It was like, well, it's just like, I always say this all the time. When you point a finger at somebody, you got three pointing back at you. It's like... You the same way. So I'm gonna rewind a little bit more, and I, I'm hoping it's gonna bring. Yeah, I'm hoping it's gonna bring it all together. <laughs> the same way I just ask you the questions that I ask you, mm-hmm. and we processed it. That's what therapy does. Mm-hmm. So if a person is experienced, whether it's church hurt, church hurt, trauma, or anything else, going in, sitting down, processing, reflecting, talking. You're already on. I'm not saying you're not healed. I'm just saying like those are <laughs> <laughs> those are the type of examples of how people like yeah. enter their healing journey by being yeah. willing to go somewhere and ask, let people ask them questions, whether it's tough, easy, mm-hmm. help them process, and that's that's what it is. Yeah. So how how what would uh, how does a, a healed person look in your opinion? Able to forgive. Mm-hmm. Able to move forward. Um. Me personally, how I like to test out I'm healed is if I'm able to do something that I couldn't do when I wasn't. For example, you remember whenever somebody was going to prayer line, like, oh, I got shoulder pain, and they mm-hmm. get prayer, and then they're like, wave your hands in the air, you know, because mm-hmm. you're trying to demonstrate yeah. that the shoulder is healed. Yeah, It's the same thing emotionally. Mm. You see someone, and it was a point where you couldn't stand to be in the same room with them. That's so or good. Or you didn't want anything to do with them. And then when you see them and you're like, oh, hey, how are you? Mm-hmm. And you mean it. You're not being funny or anything. You really care about them. You can pray for them. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about some, I want you to, you know, yeah. not that type of prayer, but yeah. just like God help them or even God help me see them the way that you see them. Yeah. That's one of the prayers that's helped me a lot with, with forgiving people is once you're able to pray for them, then you're working towards healing. Yeah. When you can see, look at a person and see past the negative, the ugly, and still see them as God cares about them, and that's still a soul. You likely forgive the person. Yeah, likely. Everybody has their degrees, but <laughs> I, I would say likely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think that's that's perfect because I know for me, like that's that's literally how I look at it. It's like you don't see, and I, I made this reference before. It's like, you don't see a person that has been healed by God. Go back to him. It's like, God, I need you to, I need another touch. I need you to touch my elbow again. <laughs> I pointed to my shoulder. I said elbow. <laughs> but, <laughs> I need you to touch this again, God, because it ain't healed hundred percent fully. If God touched you and he healed you, it's, you good. You good as gold. Um, and I think the same, and like you said, emotionally, it goes with being, with healing, well, I'm sorry, well, not with healing, but with forgiving a person and actually walking towards that journey of healing. Healing shows that you're able to move forward 
still live your life and that person not affect you. Um, cause like me now, I don't, I don't, I don't care. I can, I can, <laughs> how I knew that I was completely healed was when I could sit down and listen to a whole sermon and not get triggered. <laughs> <laughs> And not only that, but it was like how I knew I was healed was like how I could just, like you said, pray for people. Like I pray for, I pray for this person probably more than times that I can count. And it's not because of like the fact that I'm just like, you know, like, you know, no, I I see the attacks. I see the stuff that's coming. And it's just like, you know, I know that we need to be unified as one as part as a body of Christ. Yeah. And so I'm not sitting here, you know, praying curses and stuff like that. And like the devil is a lie. Like right. well, can't be a Christian and praying curses. Uh, but it's like I pray blessings. I pray God, that God continue to bless and heal and deliver and touch and do all these different things. Because why? Because like I said, we all need each other. Like if we all gonna if the if the goal and the aim is to get to heaven, how can we do that if we're not healed with the people that's here with us on earth? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> so how I compare it is like, why would you walk with a limp mm. whenever you can walk? Fully have your full range of motion. Yeah, let it go and move on. Mm. Excuse me. Yeah, let it go and move on. Yeah. If you're, I mean, some people they walk with a limp for a while. Some people just grateful that they're walking Mm -hmm. because at one point they may not have even been able to do that much. But just being able to to do what you can do and let God do the rest. And I know that that sounds really churchy, but the Bible literally says that some people were healed instantly and some were healed as they went. Yeah. So some forgiveness may not be as quickly as it is for others, but it doesn't mean that you can't heal and you can't forgive. Right. So from start from where you are and, you know, start your journey. So did you have any questions for me since this is my therapy session? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're there. Okay. Here's one. What was your intention? Aside from the poll that you did on social media, why did you want to, or why did you feel it was necessary to address this topic on your podcast? Um, largely because, one, I understand the need for people to be healed. Mm-hmm. Um, me and my wife, we just recently um, been elevated, <laughs> you know, to a new role in our church. Um, we're over the prayer team now. Um, thank you. Well, we send you my prayer requests, but go ahead. Yeah, send them on. Send them on. Send me all your prayer requests. <laughs> So that's why y'all be seeing me asking for prayer requests and stuff like that because we we really be praying. Okay. But, <laughs> but um, but in that process, onboarding new people that's coming in and want to be a part of the prayer team, want to be a part of the altar team. One of the things that we ask is, you know, are you healed? <laughs> are you healed from whatever? And it's not. And this is the thing. I understand that everybody you know has their their things that they're dealing with, struggling with, and whatnot. But there's certain stuff that you know that you're struggling with that you have not been fully healed from. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be hard for you to try to pray for people, for try to minister to people when you're broken, when you're hurt, or when you're. Oh, my light went out. <sighs> the devil is alive. <laughs> but it's hard to minister to someone when you're hurt and you're bleeding all over them like that. Um, and so that's why we ask that question, because if it's a process to healing, then we want to walk with you in that process. But you ain't going to be praying for nobody <laughs> in that process. Okay. And so uh, and that's the thing, because I want I want people to be healed. I want people to be whole. I want people to see God the way I see God. Okay. Um, and honestly, I want people to see God probably even better than the way I see God as well, too. Because I think that in order for us to really thrive as a Christian, I'm not, I'm not talking about as a Christian nation, like, you know, like a Republican, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but in order for us to thrive as a Christian body, body as the body of Christ, mm-hmm. we have to embody how Christ was. Mm-hmm. We have to embody everything that he is. He was able to, what when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he still died on the cross for our sins, for the stuff that we did. Um, and I'm not saying that you got to be sacrificed for, for the person that hurt you. <laughs> but you have to definitely live that out on display. Oh, yeah. And you have to display that in the way that you live your life by moving, for lack of a better word, but moving on past those things, being healed from it and able to pray someone out of a situation or pray someone through a situation and minister them through that situation and disciple them through the situation. Mm-hmm. 
You can't do that if you haven't been healed properly. So I applaud you for being willing to ask the tough questions. Yeah. Because some people may see things and they're like, yeah, we're not going to touch that. We're just going to pray for them while they're praying for people. So, <laughs> yeah, I applaud you for, it, for being able to do that. Yeah. Um, I think probably those are the only questions that I have, but there is one point that I want to bring up. What's up? So initially, during the earlier part of the conversation, you were saying that some people say like, oh, I'm traumatized. Mm-hmm. Quick story. When I was I was five, um, it was this summer, me and my sister went to Baltimore to visit some extended family. And my dream job, my first dream job was to be a male lady. Mm-hmm. I was just like <laughs> very, very fascinated with post office bosses. So <laughs> I mean if you want to I'm, you know, I, I know no, somebody at the post no, office that can get <laughs> we moved on from there. I'm gonna tell you how we got past that dream. So um I was there were no kids at the house. My mom was at work. My sister was asleep and I was bored. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm playing male lady, you know, doing what I do. So I ended up sticking a hairpin in an electrical socket because mm. basically I was pretending that the key was the hairpin. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I'm trying to put the mail in the post office box. It was a whole thing. Yeah. Like imagination. And I got shocked very badly. Yeah. Like it knocked the house. It knocked all the lights out. Wow. In this house, and one next to it. Wow. And so obviously, you know, I got my tail. Yeah. So you have, <laughs> I'm in pain, I got a whooping, and I, had to, <laughs> and I had to lay down uh, and take a nap. Yeah. All of this going on, yeah. you know, after that. Fast forward to like 20 to 25 years later, mm-hmm. someone asked me, could I give them a jump? Mm-hmm. And they wanted me to use the jumper cables. When I saw those blue sparks, I started mm-hmm. having heart palpitations. Mm. And, that was, and at first it was like, oh, this is weird. Like, why is this bothering me? But once I actually processed it, it came from, from that, mm-hmm, from playing with the electrical socket. Mm-hmm. So what I want people to understand is not me. I don't go around saying like, oh, I'm traumatized because I can still plug stuff up and <laughs> you know right. do whatever it is that I need to do. But I want people to understand that regardless of how small your trauma may be to other people, if it's still impacting or impairing an area of your life, it's still worth looking into and getting treatment for. That's good. Yeah. Because everything is not going to be you saw a murder. Yeah. Or, you know, something, um, what some people say significant, air quotes, that they're doing to you. If it you notice that it's impairing you, then it's worth looking into. Yeah. Are, are like, certain traumas categorized? Like, there's, like, severe traumas and then there's, like, miniature traumas? Or are they all kind of, like, in the same bubble is a trauma based on the dsm if i recall it correctly and i'll look and if it's anything different i'll send it to you for your show notes Mm -hmm. but based on what i understand it's just categorized as trauma now Mm -hmm. you may have something like complex trauma where some people experience trauma multiple times like Mm -hmm. um, service yeah people in the service and things like that Mm -hmm. but usually it's just trauma if you fit the criteria for like um ptsd post-traumatic stress disorder there's not like severe moderate or um mild it's just ptsd yeah Okay, I didn't know that. I mean, because I figured, because you know, we hear all the time. It's like, oh, you got big sins, little sins. You got this, you got that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, we we kind of lump all of that, you know, in that same same mind frame, and uh, you know, we kind of have that same mindset when it comes to like trauma. It's like, oh well, you know, well, you won't rape by somebody, but you know, right, right. you know, we go to that extreme. Um, and like, well, you should be able to get over it quick, but it's still. Whatever it is, it still has some type of hold, you know, in that regard. 